So my parents have a cat. The cat's name is Bob, and Bob had a very hard life before my parents found Bob because Bob has no tail. Bob lost a fight once, and it was a bad fight. And the, the reason that Bob probably lost that fight is because Bob is severely cross-eyed and can't see anything. And so I've, having been whooped in a fight, badly, and uh, being and without a tail, he runs like a rabbit. He keeps, keeps, keeps his rear end up really high, so it's a very odd looking cat. And so having been whooped by life and before my, cat, my parents adopted him, he's scared. And so if I'm there for four days visiting, about day three, I might see him. He might sneak out from under the bed. And when he comes out from under the bed in my parents' room, he, he always goes along the corner of the, the walls. He, he never actually comes through the middle of the room because something might jump him. The one thing that he will come out for every time is food. Because my, uh, my mom has this particular way of saying something to eat. And, and there's a cant to her voice that I'm not even going to attempt to replicate. And. Uh, the cat will hear that and come running. And, and that really high, sort of weird rabbit looking gait. And, and my mom will put down a dish of cat food. But remember, the cat's severely cross-eyed, has no depth perception. So it comes up to the food, but it's not quite sure where the food is in space, so it circles it <laughs> to try to figure out where exactly is the food. I tried to get my mom to take a video, but she wouldn't. She said, Andy, are you going to make fun of my cat? Yes. Yes, I am. <laughs> it's just the most amazing thing to see, because the cat it just circles until it can figure out where to put its face down to, to eat. I thought of that as I was thinking about the, the church in the first centuries. The church was much like Bob the cat because it knew what it needed. Bob the cat needed to figure out where the food was. And the first century's church, they needed to figure out where Jesus was. Right? That's their challenge. They want to figure out how do we talk about people asking, who do you say that I am? Right? Who is Jesus? They, they know that they've been following Jesus and it's made a difference in their lives and the Spirit's moving and they're being transformed and they have community and purpose and salvation. And so these early Christians in these first centuries, they know that following Jesus matters, but they still have to be able to answer this question, who do you say that I am? And so it's interesting, if you look at all the various arguments that the church has had, it's like Bob. They're circling, trying to figure out, is this how we talk about Jesus, or, or is this? Right? They're all kind of circling Jesus, and they're, everyone has their pet theories. You know what I'm talking about with a pet theory? And what happens if you have a pet theory? This is why I think something's happened. And if you say, this is why, right? And people tend to be very uh, stubborn about their pet theories, right? So people, all, all these different churches, they have their own pet theories about how, how do we understand Jesus. And we're, I want to go through a few of them because uh, they're intriguing. And this is what the early church is doing. It's trying to figure out how to say Jesus is God and, and human. Uh, one of the early churches is arguing that Jesus was fully God, but he couldn't have been fully human because that would have been demeaning to God, and God is too dignified. If you think about think about someone who you res you respect greatly, right? Pick, pick someone you respect greatly. How hard is it to watch someone you respect greatly suffer? You know that sort of that tightness of face when there's someone suffering and that sweat that breaks out on their brow, right? Think about someone who you respect and honor, someone who's truly dignified. Think of them suffering. And, and you know, it's just not, you, you hate to see that. You just think that's not right. Someone I respect so much should not be in that much pain. And that's the same inclination that's leading people to say this. And this is the idea that it's like holographic Jesus. Jesus really wasn't on the cross suffering. He just looked like it. And so if you poked him, your hand would just go right through, like holographic Jesus. And so there's one church that's arguing for this. It's called docetism, which is from uh, the word for to seem. Jesus seemed to be there. And the problem being uh, was that John tells us that the word became flesh, right? John 1, the word became flesh. So you can't exactly say that Jesus wasn't there because it said the word became flesh. So that's an, an, that argument was eventually rejected. Another church has its pet theory. It, it's circling Jesus. It says, well, let's, let's see about this. They said, Jesus was fully human, 
And what happened was, Jesus was born of a woman, raised, good man, grows up, and, and God looks down and says, it's about time that I do something about Israel. Hmm, what's my best option? That guy looks good. I'll adopt him. Right? It's called adoptionism. The idea that Jesus is fully human and that God looks down and says, ah, now you're my son. It's like writing someone into the will. Right? And so, so there are some people, yeah, that, that's it, adoptionism, that's, that's how it works. It sounds reasonable, but then you read Matthew 1. Ma in Matthew 1, the, the angel says to, to, to um, Jesus' father, Lord, who has a name, Joseph, I was at a youth rally all yesterday, and I got back, and I might be a bit tired. That might be showing. Uh, Joseph, the angel says to Joseph, you will call him Emmanuel, God with us, which is not saying, it's, it's the present tense, right? It's not saying God will be with you eventually if I decide to adopt Jesus. That would have been a much longer name, wouldn't it? No, it's God with us, present tense. So it's not a, we can't say that God sort of adopts Jesus, fully human and adopted. Eh, well, that doesn't work either. So there's another, uh, another point of view. So another guy named Arius, uh, he, his, his, he's circling Jesus and he says, this is what I think. Here, here's how I, I define it. He says that Jesus is fully human and fully God but he was created. Like the, the idea that in the, in the beginning was the Father, and then the Father creates everything that is, and Jesus is part of creation because he's the Son, and sons are created. And, and so Arius makes this argument, and, and the rest of the church, he convinces enough people of this that they have to have a meeting to figure out what they think about it. It's called Nicaea, from which we get the Nicene Creed. You may have said it once or twice in your life. And the Nicene Creed has a line that's specifically aimed at Arius. If you remember the phrase, Jesus is begotten, not made. That's, that's for you, Arius, right? Begotten, because fathers beget sons, but he's not made. There was never a time when Jesus was not. Right? That, that is a, a, the important thing they got to hold on to there. It's not that J Jesus is God, but kind of a second-class God. No, Jesus is fully God, the Father is fully God. You have to hold that together. And this argument gets so hot that in the middle of debating this, one of the bishops, a Bishop Nick, Nicholas, comes up and, and, and takes out Nick, uh, Arius. He, he just punches him, knocks him out in the middle of this church meeting. Bishop Nicholas was Bishop Nicholas of Myrna, who later was, became a saint, Saint Nicholas of Myrna. And then his name is then abbreviated, Saint Nick. So if you ever wonder was who, who, was on Saint, who was the first person on St. Nick's naughty list, now you know. The guy who inspired Santa Claus. His naughty list, Arius, the guy that Santa Claus punched. Uh, when Thomas looks at Jesus in the res resurrection, Thomas declares, my Lord and my God. And that's the moment we say, he doesn't say, my Lord, and you know, almost God, not quite God, but still real impressive. No, he says, my Lord and my God. So he, Arius, no, okay, we, we reject that. If you look at the front of your bulletin, there are other, there, there's a whole circle of, of people, of different positions that people argue for over time. And if you want to go home and look them up, there, Wikipedia just has great entries on all of these. But... <clears throat> This is what's happening for the first centuries. People will have an argument. This is how I think we should understand Jesus. Uh, nope, nope. This is how I think we should understand Jesus. And we might think that, thankfully, now we have it all figured out, right? We have it all figured out. We know exactly who Jesus is. We're still, we're not arguing about this. Well, actually, yes. Yes, we are. If you talk to various people about who Jesus is, you will still hear various positions and opinions. I, as I just talk to people about Jesus, or as they talk to me, that's what happens. I'm a pastor. If people ask what you do, oh, I'm a pastor, and then they start telling me about Jesus. Uh, I've, as I hear some people talk about Jesus, they'll, take, they'll talk about Jesus a, a, as this sort of scary, judgmental Lord who's going to, you better just watch out because Jesus is going to judge you. And, and this approach is usually uh, uses the King James. I mean, you may have noticed this. King James was a great translation three to four hundred years ago. Now, I don't think we continue to use it because we like to use old verbs like beseecheth. How many of you have said beseech in the last week? 
Exactly. We're not using the King James. People are using the King James. Many of them are not using it because they love the language. They're using it because it, it makes Jesus look highfalutin. It makes Jesus look like impressive and imperial, and he's the judge who's going, you've got to watch out for, for, for Jesus. This is a, there was a, a pastor by the name of Mark Driscoll who was preaching about Jesus, as pastors tend to do, and he spent a few minutes of his sermon talking about how Jesus made mistakes, and the church was so uncomfortable with that, when they put that video of his sermon online, they cut that section out, because they didn't want to talk about it, that Jesus would make mistakes. But we read in Acts that Jesus grew in wisdom. And wisdom is not just knowing what to do, it's knowing how to do it. And so I believe that Jesus made mistakes. Right? I would have loved to sit at, G at the table with Jesus and his parents, Joseph and Mary and all that, but uh, I wouldn't have wanted to sit in Jesus' first chair. Because what's the likelihood that your first chair is going to be stable? Yeah, it's not going to happen. Anyone's first chair is going to be kind of wobbly and rocky, and I'm not sure I'd want to be the one to sit on it. And Jesus is fully human, and that means that his first chair was probably not the, a work of art. In the same way that when, we, when I started cooking for the first time, I overcooked pork loin and I undercooked steaks. And I have served Olivia some rather tough pork and some rather bloody beef. Sorry. And, uh, and I got better, right? I, I've learned from my mistakes, and I'm sure Jesus did as well. That's not to say Jesus sinned. Sinning is doing that which is against God's plan. But making mistakes is how we grow in wisdom and, and, and maturity and, and in stature. And that's what Scripture tells us. So, yes, we need to say that Jesus is fully human, and that means we make mistakes. A another point of view I hear today when people talk about Jesus is sort of this... Uh, Jesus is my boyfriend, buddy Jesus, low-key, just come as you are, and it's just great. It's just, everything's chill, don't worry. Jesus accepts you just as you are, no questions asked. And you, pay, you should pay attention to Jesus, but you know, pay attention to other people too, because Jesus was cool, and so was Gandhi, and, and so was Buddha, and there's some other very cool people. And um, I've heard people argue that this sort of low view of Jesus, fully human and uh, not sure about the God thing. I've heard people argue that the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 is that everyone shared. Like, the, when 5,000 people show up, some of them brought lunch and some of them didn't. And when Jesus broke bread, the miracle there is that everyone looked at their neighbor and says, yeah, I'll feed you too. No. That, that's not what it says. The Bible says he fed 5,000 people with a few loaves and some old dried up fish. And, and that, that's what we hold on to. Right? So this idea that uh, we know exactly who Jesus is, we're still arguing about it. I still people hear people talk about Jesus as fully human, just wants to be a buddy and get along with you, but let's not talk about the miracles. I still hear people talk that, you know, Jesus is scary, and, but you really not, can't really get too close to him because he might get you. If you remember what a heresy is, a heresy is taking one part of faith and pulling it way out of context. And that's what we see with this. Taking one argument and just taking it entirely out of context. And the response to heresy is always to go back to Scripture and say, you know what, that, that seems whatever, but let's read the Bible. If you want to know who Jesus is, you've got to read the Bible. The Bible is everything that is necessary for salvation. And in the Scriptures we read that Jesus is fully human, which means we can follow him on his path, and we read that he is fully God, so we know where that path leads. It leads to the kingdom of God. Jesus is the only one who can bring what we need most, the possibility of full reconciliation between God and humanity, right, such that we can say that Jesus is fully human, and that means that he spit up all over his mama, because that's what babies do. But it also means he's fully God, which means he can say from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The first Jesus who made a wobbly chair that I'm not sure was fit to sit on was the one, one who then conquered death. Right? This is what we hold together. That Jesus, that's, what, that's the Jesus we get when we read the scriptures. We read of the Jesus who speaks colloquial. He, Jesus talked very lowbrow low slang. The language of the New Testament is colloquial slang. I mean, if we, southern drawl type of, of speech. Yet, when Jesus ta taught, people paid attention because he spoke with authority, right? Born of a woman, Jesus had to be potty trained, but he was also there at the beginning of creation. It's a mystery. 
Right? We can circle Jesus all we want. And we can, I mean, the risk is that we try to figure it out too closely. And there are certain things that we are not going to know this side of death. There are certain things that I can't tell you, no matter how much I read the scriptures, because the Bible has everything we need to know for salvation, but it doesn't have everything. There are parts of who Jesus is that we will not understand in this lifetime. And so the best we can say is thank God that we have a Lord who knows our struggles, who understands our suffering, can pave the way that we can follow because he's fully human, but then can, we can follow him to the kingdom of God because he is God. The path that we follow with each of us today, you know, if we want to know who Jesus is, who it is that we follow, the answer is never going to be an abstract philosophical discussion about the nature of suffering. It's never going to be contemplating with your eyes closed and just pondering the nature of reality. Or, If you want to know who Jesus is, it's always going to be read, read the Bible. Read about a father who sends his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Read of a son who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality as a thing with God, with God as a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. One who came not to be served, but to serve. The one who forgave us from the cross. The best answer to the question, who is Jesus, is always going to be, read the book. Point to what it says, and then join in with Thomas when he says, My Lord and my God. Amen.